morning, everyone that's online with me today. Thanks to the faithful remnant for hanging in there for session three of having fun learning English grammar. Um, we're still having some problems getting the moderator online, so I'm just going to take it away here. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Jeanette Ebenhack, and this is the third session of our course. Um, in the first session, we learned about nouns, proper, abstract, and plurals. Um, um, and last time we learned about adjectives, pronouns, and articles. And I wanna uh, say up front that I apologize for going over time last time. I'm going to try my best to hold this to an hour. And so I'm gonna ask Dr. Algarhi here to give me a heads up when we get to five minutes uh, to the hour. Uh, I heard back from uh, at least one person who was with us last time that they were a little overwhelmed and I'm not surprised. Um, I was overwhelmed. You know, the um, part about articles was really challenging. So uh, again, if you uh, didn't get it, don't, um, don't fret about that. We're doing a pretty high flyover, uh, not an in-depth um, study of, of any of these parts of speech. So hang in there. And today I'm going to pull back and do something that uh, hopefully will be a little bit more fun and a little less taxing. I want to, in this session, to look at synonyms, antonyms, contradictions, conjunctions, and if we have time, verbs and adverbs. So, what is a synonym? A synonym is a word that has the same or nearly the same meaning as another word. So, here you have in this picture 10 ways to say beautiful in English. Appealing, gorgeous, ravishing, stunning, pretty, lovely, dazzling, alluring, and good looking. So these are all synonyms. And um, before we had computers, we used to have something called a thesaurus, which was how we would look up um, synonyms. And I'm old enough to own a thesaurus. So I want, in case you've never seen one of these, I want to just show you a little bit how it works. So if we were looking for the synonym for beautiful, in the back, we would have listings of all the words, and we would look up beautiful, and it would give us a number to uh, check later, uh, previously in the book. Um, and so you look up that number, and that's where you find all the list of the synonyms. But now that we have computers, there's a much easier way to look up synonyms. Um, so I've written out the sentence here, 10 ways to say beautiful in English. So if I wanted to look up the synonym, I would highlight, whoops, sorry about that. I would highlight the word beautiful and hit uh, shift F7. And I would get uh, a box over here on the side, beautiful is right here. And then they would say it's an adjective meaning lovely. And you would have uh, several um, synonyms there. And then there's some down below. And um, this is really lovely in terms of people, but this is lovely more in terms of things, uh, scenery, for instance. Um, I also uh, discovered just while I was kind of um, checking this out that you can actually have your computer, at least uh, in Microsoft Word, it will um, sound out the word for you. If you hit this little icon, it will give you the word. You'll also notice that um, it has the antonym for the word. So the antonym or the opposite of beautiful is ugly or unattractive. So also, I've uh, discovered that uh, you can hit this little button down here, um, and that will change from US English to British English or other languages. 
So you can see your synonyms um, uh, in different dialects or um, different languages. So, so synon finding synonyms has become a lot easier with your computer. And um, I find it extremely helpful when I'm doing writing. I use the uh, Shift F7 key a lot to make my writing a little more interesting and a little more accurate. Um, but I did just want to uh, point out again that in terms of this woman that we're talking about, who can be lovely, attractive, gorgeous, and fine looking, we wouldn't normally say that she is handsome. Handsome is a word um, that is sometimes used for women in the past more, but mostly it's used for men. And certainly we wouldn't want to say that the woman is picturesque. No, that's more um, for a beautiful scene. Um, so, so you have to be a little careful when you're uh, using the thesaurus. Um, you can't just assume that every word is an exact synonym for what you're looking for. So I want to do a little exercise here. And so we, uh, I was hoping to have the moderator to help in. But since we don't, I'm just going to ask you to shout out what you think the word, the missing word is here. Now, this is um, part of the book from, by Brian Cleary called Pitch and Throw, Grasp and Know, What is a Synonym? And you know from the other books that I've quoted in the previous sessions, that all of his uh, books are in rhyme. So keep that in mind and um, that'll help you figure out what the missing word is. So we're looking for words that basically mean the same. Synonyms give you selection and choice. They make you sound just like a scholar. Fast and quick, ill and sick, a greenback, a buck, or a dollar. Yell and holler, jump and leap, fly and soar, doze and sleep. Synonyms help us be less repetitious by letting us choose between plates, between blue plates or dishes. Celestial bodies are often called stars. Streets can be avenues. Autos are cars. There are words like toss and pitch and throw. Comprehend and grasp and know. K-N-O-W. A lovely and pretty and beautiful city. A cat or a fe feline could be called a kitty. Without them, our language would surely be boring. They let us pick showering, raining, or pouring, pouring rain. Each synonym has quite a similar meaning, like washing and scouring, scrubbing, and cleaning. They help give our stories more interesting voices and give us alternatives, substitutes, substitutes, choices. Easy and simple, a blemish, a pimple. Just make up your mind and start choosing. Exit and leave, lie and deceive. Funny and somewhat amusing. Synonyms, synonyms can help you to get or procure a mighty big vocabulary. So pick among, pick among difficult, hard, or demanding. It needn't be frightening or scary. You can choose between grateful or thankful beholden for the sneakers or tennis shoes, yellow or golden. So whether you're moseying, strolling, or walking, babbling, chattering, mumbling or talking, synonym, synonyms let us be very specific and say what we mean like super or terrific. But just as I mentioned before, 
you do have to be careful about choosing your synonyms. I like this little uh, saying by Dimitri Martin. He says, saying, I'm sorry is the same as saying, I apologize, except at a funeral. So I'd like for you to get out a piece of paper and a pencil. And uh, I need a little help with this, Dr. Algarhi. So if you would get your pencil and paper out also, I'd like for you to give me a synonym for the word Mary, M-E-R-R-Y. And a synonym for old. A synonym for called. And a synonym for bowl. B-O-W-L. Now give me a synonym for the word little. Eating. Put. Hold. And the word good. I'll give you just a few seconds more to get all your synonyms in order. So this is a little, again, a Mad Lib that comes from um, Brian Cleary. So, Old King Cole was, uh, what's a synonym for Mary? Marriage, right? Mary, no. Happy. Okay. Like happy might be a synonym for Mary. Old King Cole was a happy old soul, and a Mary, what's a synonym for old? So a synonym is a same meaning, right? As exactly, a, right. Same meaning. The same meaning. So old, maybe. Ancient. Ancient. Is and, and a Mary ancient soul was he? He, what's a synonym for called? Pleasing. Maybe yelled for his pipe and he called for his with a synonym for bowl. Okay, actually, I don't know a lot of synonyms for bowl, but you know, it's something that holds water, so I'm going to say cup. cup. And he with a synonym for called. No, it is a small uh, little to call or to demand. So maybe he demanded his fiddlers three. Okay. All right. Let's hope we can do a little better on the second one. So what is a synonym for little? Small. Small Jack Horner. What's a synonym for sat? Sat. Sat. Mm-hmm. Did I have that one? Did I miss that one? No, you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, sorry, my fault. Kneeled in his corner. And what's a synonym for eating? How about consuming his Christmas pie? What's a synonym for put? Maybe, maybe he plunged in his thumb. And a synonym for pulled? Maybe yanked out a plum? And said, what a, what's a synonym for good? How about terrific, boy, am I? Okay, so this just shows you, these are a couple of very familiar um, nursery rhymes that I learned by heart. I don't know uh, about you, but uh, just kind of having some fun showing how you can substitute words. So let's uh, do a little quiz and I'm going to uh, start a poll here. I'm going to launch it. And as it's coming up, 
Um, let me just read you this uh, little comic over here. It says, toast. Mmm, this toast is good. No, it's very good. It's quite tasty. Maybe even delicious. Quite savory. Highly appetizing. Decidedly flavorful. I wouldn't say succulent. All right, looks like some of you are already doing the quiz. Um, the first uh, question is, Mary is a synonym for Mary. So M-A-R-Y is a synonym for M-E-R-R-Y. Is that true or false? Strolling is a synonym for walking. Buck and greenback are synonyms for dollar. Sneakers is a synonym for tricky. Okay, let's see how we're doing here on the poll. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and let's go over. Um, most of you were correct. Mary, uh, oops, let me share the results. Uh, Mary is a Name, my name is Mary, um, but M-E-R-R-Y, as in our little poem, means happy or, you know, joyful. So these are two different words. One is a um, noun, a, a proper noun, and one is an adjective. Okay, strolling is a synonym for walking. Yes, that's true. Most of you got that. Okay, buck, greenback, and greenback are synonyms for dollar. Yep, this is true. This is, I guess, um, colloquial English. I have a buck, I have a greenback, I have a dollar. So um, don't worry if you didn't get that one, because that's probably English slang. How about the fourth one? Sneakers is a synonym for tricky. Well, we had about half and half thinking that it's true. Uh, sneakers are actually shoes. Sneakers is a, another word for tennis shoes. Uh, so that is a noun. Tricky is a um, adjective. So, you know, it's a tricky question. This was a tricky question. So, all righty. Let's move on then to... Antonyms. Antonyms are words that mean the opposite of another word. So in this example, hot is the antonym of cold, and cold is the antonym of hot. So again, we're um, taking our cues from Brian Cleary in his book called Stop and Go, Yes and No, What is an Antonym? You uh, hopefully will recall that I sent you a whole list of his books and uh, um, URLs where you can hear them read on YouTube. And I highly encourage you to do this. They're just clever, um, fun little books that I encourage you to check out. So let's see what Brian Cleary says about antonyms. Antonyms are opposites. They're words like stop and go. See how different those words are? They're just like yes and no. Big and small are antonyms, and so are front and back. Fast and slow, and high and low, as well as white and black. Up and down are antonyms, just like excite and soothe. Left and right and dark and light and also rough and smooth. If it weren't for opposites, we'd have no way to say, I'd like to have my chocolate hot because it's so 
coal today. Like safe compared to dangerous, like heavy is too light, shy too bold, and young too old, and even dim too bright. They're opposite in meaning, just like shamefully and proudly. They show a total contrast, as in quietly and loudly. Or Mrs. Scott prefers when we are serious, not silly. Or the road in San Francisco isn't flat, but rather hilly. If anybody's been to San Francisco, you know that's very true. Antonyms are words that are quite opposite in meaning, like sleep and wake, or give and take, like messing is to cleaning. They offer rich, contrasting words that help us to distinguish day from night and wrong from right and brighten up our English. Out and in are antonyms, and so are neat and messy. Shallow, deep, and lose and keep. Informal and quite dressy. They point out major differences like rainy versus sunny. Sluggish, quick, healthy, sick, or grim, and kind of funny. Plump and thin are antonyms, like bashful is to flirty, real to fake and make to break, like spotless is to dirty. Sometimes antonyms are made with un before a word. This is how we get unkind unable and unheard. With a word like mispronounce, mistrust, misspelled, mismatched, each word becomes an antonym with this prefix attached. Often adding dis or im or sometimes even non will help you build an antonym with these beginnings on. For example, disrespect, impossible, non-fiction. Their prefixes are helpful in displaying contradiction. Sometimes putting anti, ill, or er are often in before a word. We'll make an antonym. Shall we begin? Okay, so. What is the prefix for social to make it an antonym? Antisocial. What is the prefix that we put in front of lock to make an antonym? Again, anti lock, as in anti lock breaks. How about freeze? How do we make that uh, an antonym? Antifreeze. Again, what you put in your car. On this one, regular, you make that an antonym by putting the prefix IR, irregular. Logical becomes an antonym if we say illogical. And equalities becomes an antonym if we put in, inequalities. If, oops. Sorry about that. If antonyms did not exist, we wouldn't have the words to say, I like the quiet, not the noisy kind of birds. So, okay, let's do another little quiz to see how well you're getting this. So let me launch this second quiz here. And the first question is, the Antonym for becoming is a non-becoming, anti-becoming, unbecoming, or misbecoming. 
becoming um, means, you know, you could use that in, for um, uh, an adjective about a woman. She's very becoming. And she's very pretty. So what is the antonym for becoming? And the second one, the antonym for guided is a disguided, misguided, imguided, or non-guided. And question number three, the antonym for pure is anti-pure, impure, non-pure, or unpure. What do you think? And finally, the antonym for reverent is irreverent, irreverent, anti-reverent, or non-reverent. I'll give you just a few more seconds to get your answers in. Okay, here we go. All right. The antonym for becoming is unbecoming. Uh, the third choice there. So the antonym for guided is misguided. The antonym for pure, impure. And the antonym for reverent, meaning showing great respect, is Irreverent A. All right. I want to move on then to talking about contractions. Contractions are two or sometimes three words combined into one word using an apostrophe. So the book that Brian Cleary has written about apostrophes is called I'm and won't, there and don't. What's a contraction? And if you notice, um, or maybe you will notice from now on in that Brian Cleary uses a lot of contractions in his poetry. I've taken a few of them out just because I didn't want uh, you to be confused up until we had a chance to talk about contractions. But um, if you're reading the books for him for yourself, you'll find there's lots of contractions. So let's um, take a look at what he says. Contractions take a couple words, or sometimes even three, and shrink them into only one, as in, she's drinking tea. She's is the contraction, and it shortens up she is. It takes two words and makes them one, as in, that's mine, not his. As punctuation goes, contractions always feature these. They take the place of letters and they're called apostrophes. Often, sometimes contractions join another word to not, like Shouldn't it be colder now? And can't I take your spot? I don't think this shoe is mine. Isn't it absurd? All these turn a two-word phrase into a single word. So let's just look at on the right side here and um, go over some of the words that are created when we um, contract another word to not. So are not becomes aren't. Cannot becomes can't. Could not becomes couldn't. Did not becomes didn't. Does not doesn't. Do not don't. Had not hadn't. Has not, hasn't, and have not, haven't. So 
So those are the ones that you will see the most often. But then there's a few others. Mightn't or might not. Mustn't or must not. And here's one you will not see very often. Shan't, shall not. Just the word shall in English is not uh, used very often these days. Uh, but in Old English, you might uh, run across the words shall not or shan't. Shouldn't uh, is shouldn't is should not. Weren't, were not. Won't, will not. Here's hadn't again. I don't know why they uh, uh, repeated some of those. Alrighty. Other times contractions shorten are to is or am, as in I'm sure you're hungry and he's cooking up some ham. So let's take a look at the contractions that are used by combining uh, forms of to be. So I am is shortened to I'm, in uh, like in the sentence, I'm tired. He is, is shortened to he's, he's tired today, he worked late last night. She is to she's, she's playing the piano. It is, it's my favorite song. You are, you're going to Italy, that's great. We are, my team won, we're the league champions. They are, Jack and Wendy called, they're going to meet us at 7.30. So I wanna go over uh, some common mistakes. Um, as you recall, um, we had this um, little irony that we looked at in the very first session. It says, irony is when someone writes, you're an idiot. Learn grammar properly so you can insult uh, properly. So now we know what's wrong with this sentence is your is a pronoun, whereas what we need here is a pronoun plus uh, a verb, you are an idiot. So it should be Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. And I love this little cartoon that says, very important, if you don't know the difference between your and your with an apostrophe, it's because your with an apostrophe spending too much time in front of your television. So another um, um, common mistake in writing English is misuse of the word there. There are actually three different ways to um, write the word that sounds there. So here in this uh, session, you and your, they're different. It's T-H-E-I-R different, T-H-E-R-E -E different, or T-H-E-Y-R-E, -E, they're different. So they are different. So let's go over um, these, um, what these different words mean. So if you're saying or writing there, T-H-E-I-R, that shows ownership. It's their toy. It's a possessive pronoun. If you're, um, the, the word T-H-E-R-E -E refers to a place. The ball is over there demonstrative pronoun. And then here's the contraction, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. That's the contraction for they are. There, they are going to the park. So these will crop up a lot. Uh, English speakers make, this, um, mis make mistakes with your and your and their. So um, just watch out for them. They can sneak up on you. Let's look at contractions using the word would. Would 
when it's contracted is reduced to just a D in words like I'd and she'd, as well as you'd, to name just three. So here are the contractions. He would becomes he'd. I would becomes I'd. She would becomes she'd. They would become they'd. We would need. Who would who'd or you would you'd. However, you need to be uh, on guard because had is also contracted with just a D, and they're um, spelled just exactly the same. You, the only way you can tell whether someone is trying to say he would or he had is in the context of the sentence. So again, he had, he'd, I had, I, she had, she, and etc. all the way down, all the same. You have to um, watch the sentence for the context to know which word is uh, being um, pulled on there. Um, so let's look a little bit at the word have or has or had. Again, we have had. Um, sometimes you'll find have and had have been abbreviated. Like here, I've got a puppy and I'd better get him crated. So we've already looked at the had words. Just put them there again, but let's look at the have words. I have is contracted to I've, I apostrophe V-E. They have, they've. What have, what of. We have, we've. Who have. Who've, where have, where've, you have, you've. Some of these are more common than others. Not often do you hear where've, but you'll often hear you've, you have. Contractions using do, does, did, and were, and so on. Take a phrase like does not. A contraction makes it doesn't. Try another was not. You can shorten it to wasn't. When you shorten did not, it becomes didn't. And were not becomes weren't. These are all derivatives of um, the word uh, do. I also wanted to um, Spend a little time just looking at the contractions uh, using the word will and shall. As I said before, shall is not a word that's used a lot in English anymore, but it essentially means the same as will. So you'll notice in the contraction, um, it, it's contracted just the same whether you're using will or shall. Heal, I'll. She'll, they'll, will, wheel, cool, you'll, what'll. Okay, so a sentence using he will or he shall will be he'll be there in the morning. Who will make the pie for dinner? What'll it take to win your heart? You know that I'm a winner. Contracting more than two words. Now and then, contractions shorten not just two, but three words. For example, I'd have thought this was the zoo. Contracting three words is not common. It can happen, and you might find it written, but um, uh, it doesn't happen very often. In fact, my spell checker thought that a lot of these contractions that I have in this list weren't words, so you won't, won't find them in the spell checker. But according to um, grammarians, these can actually be words. So can't have 
is cannot have. So I can't have gotten an F on that uh, test. I studied too hard. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those, but just to say that, you know, there are some contractions that we'll use, uh, we'll contract three words. I also wanted to spend just a little time talking about informal contractions, because you'll see these written a lot, and especially as more and more people are using texting, um, they're contracting a lot of words in informal ways, like a lot of, which means a lot of, I eat a lot of chocolate, or a betcha means bet you, betcha can't guess the answer. Come on actually uses uh, an apostrophe and it means, you know, encouragement, you know, come on, do it. Don't know means I don't know. I don't know what to wear. Don't you? Don't you like it? It means do you not like it? So um, I guess that's a contraction without the apostrophes of three words. Give me a break means give me, gonna, I'm gonna have my lunch. That's a word you'll hear a lot. Gotta, I gotta leave now. Gotcha, I gotcha an ice cream cone. Have to, meaning have to, I have to wash my car. Kinda is a word you'll see a lot and hear a lot. I kinda like your shoes. Let me, means let me. Let me help you. Musta. She must have been in a hurry, meaning she must have been in a hurry. Otta. You oughta phone your mom. Outta. Get me out of here. Tell them. Tell them. We should tell them the truth. Actually, uh, this little apostrophe EM. You'll see in um, Brian Cleary's poetry, he likes to uh, shorten the them to M. And you'll see that in other writings. Wanna. I want to buy that dress, meaning I want to buy that dress. Whatcha? What you doing? What you got there? So what are you doing? What have you got there? And the last one, won't you? Won't you join me for lunch? Meaning, won't you? Just a few more to give you. Um, coulda, shoulda, woulda. I could have. I should have. I would have. Uh, there's a pretty famous uh, commercial for V8 juice said, I could have had a V8. So... Then there's the uh, negative, couldna, shouldna, wouldna. I could not have, I should not have, I would not have. And then finally, ida, shida, weida. She would have, we would have, or he uh, would have. So you will hear these in English and you'll sometimes see them um, written if particularly if uh, people are writing dialogue, because this is how people speak, but it's not proper written English. So if you're writing a uh, formal paper or a term paper for your class or whatever, you want to um, avoid these informal contractions, but I wanted to go over them because you will see them and you'll definitely hear them if you're, speak if you're talking to English speakers. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about a contraction that at one time was um, considered proper English, but today is not considered proper English. And uh, it's two words, ain't and y'all. So um, today we consider these slang words. Um, and ain't is, um, can mean a lot of different things. So um, I ain't got time to talk means I haven't. But the same word, Jason says that he ain't hungry. 
That means he isn't hungry, is not hungry. You ain't from around here means you aren't from around here. And then there's the um, uh, phrase, if it ain't broke, don't f fix it. If it is not broke, don't fix it. So you will hear ain't used um, not so much by highly educated people, although you'll hear it a lot in music. Um, it's a very uh, much used word in colloquial and slang. Another word I wanted to talk about is y'all. This is a word that um, is mostly used by people living in the South in the United States, and it's a contraction of you all. In a way, it's kind of um, like the second person plural. You in the first person and you in the the plural are the same word. So people in the South seem to have made up their own word uh, for the second person plural called you all. And I found a little graphic that I thought was funny, contracting you all to you all to y'all and are not to ain't. It says that contracts to yaint. That's just funny. That's really not a word. So let's finish up. Aren't contractions useful words in speech and writing? Don't have any fear of them. I'm guessing that you won't. Then here's another little graphic that I thought you might appreciate. This person says, I just realized that never is a contraction of not ever. And blush is a contraction of blood rush see where they got that. Also, studying is a contraction of student dying. You can see why they put that in there. That word is right in student dying. All right. I hope you had a little fun with that. Okay, so um, the last thing that we're going to do is today look at a part of speech called a conjunction. And a conjunction is a word that joins together sentences, phrases, or words. The book that uh, Brian Cleary has written about conjunctions is called But and For, Yet and Nor. What is a conjunction? And in that book, he said, conjunctions are connecting words like but or and or or, yet, until, unless, and as, along with for and nor. At times, conjunctions build a bridge from one phrase to another, as in, I pick some flowers and gave them to my mother. Other times, conjunctions help to link a pair of verbs, as in, has anybody seen or smelled that dog of hers? So seen and smelled are the verbs, and or is the conjunction. Some will join two sentences, combining them as one, like, I could not be late to school so I began to run. You can see right there, I could not be late to school is a sentence. I began to run is a sentence. And so links those two sentences. Now, there are certain words that are called coordinating conjunctions. And you can remember these, there are seven of them, by remembering the acronym Fanboys, F-A-N-B-O-Y-S. F stands for for, A stands for and, N for nor, B for but, O for R, or Y for yet, and S for so. So this um, held um, question on the quiz later on about uh, what fanboys means. And so, 
this morning I was lying in bed and thinking, I got to give um, my class a little more information about what I'm talking about in terms of fanboys coordinating conjunctions. So I went on the internet to see if I could find a little poem that might be fun to give you about how you use the uh, coordinating conjunctions. Um, I couldn't find one. Uh, so I just made up a poem of my, uh, by myself. So this is a little poem that I made up in the last hour. So the first letter F, as I said, stands for the letter four, and it shows a reason or a cause. So here's a sentence that uses four. I made myself a schedule or I had a lot to do. The next word and combines either words or phrases or what could be actually be two separate sentences. I had to run the farm and do the housework too. The N of fanboy stands for nor. And this is a word that combines negatives. So my sentence here is, I didn't have an hour or even a spare minute. The B in fanboy stands for but, and this expresses an exception. I tried to do the best I could, but my heart just wasn't in it. Or offers some choices. Should I plant the corn and peas or do the dirty dishes. Y stands for yet. And this gives a contrast like or, um, but um, it's kind of a surprising contrast. I never tried so hard, never had I tried so hard, yet had so many misses. And the last letter of fanboys stands for the word so, and it shows consequences. So my final stanza of my poem was, I guess I'll just throw in the towel and head on back to school so I can finally have some time to lounge around the pool. So one more time, this great poem, just couldn't, um, uh, using the fan voice, conjunctions. I made myself a schedule for I had a lot to do. I had to run the farm and do the housework too. I didn't have an hour or even a spare minute. I tried to do the best I could, but my heart just wasn't in it. Should I plant the corn and peas or do the dirty dishes? Never had I tried so hard. It had so many misses. I guess I'll just win the towel and head on back to school so I can finally have some time to lounge around the pool. So I encourage you to take um, these uh, coordinating conjunctions for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so, and see if you can write a poem using them or just write a sentence using them. I wanna also um, acknowledge that um, I adapted my graphic here from, um, uh, a video called um, Grammar Songs, Grammar Songs by Melissa, I think it's called. And I've given you the URL down here. Um, I'm really impressed by a, the set of grammar talks, uh, this um, illustrated grammar talks that this lady named Melissa does. And so I encourage you to go on the web and um, take a look at what she does. She's very good at explaining uh, the parts of speech. I think you'll find it really helpful. Beginning sentences with conjunctions. <clears throat> Some think a conjunction shouldn't ever be the word that's used to start a sentence, but I say, that's absurd. And why would I declare this? So that everyone can see that sometimes a conjunction starts your sentence perfectly. Um, 
Yeah, when I was uh, going to school, we were taught you do not start a sentence with a conjunction, but, and, so, for, that sort of thing. But I agree with uh, Brian Cleary. There's a lot of times in my writing that I do start sentences with conjunctions. And I think um, this little graphic over here is absolutely right. When you start a sentence with a coordinating conjunction, just be sure it's strong. Be sure it has a function. So, um, so it is possible and sometimes even the best choice to start with a conjunction, but just make sure it really has um, a, a strong use. Correlated conjunctions. We have five minutes left and I think we can just finish out this session on conjunctions, so. Some conjunctions work in pairs, like this one, either or. We'll either eat our pizza on a plate or on the floor. So these two words, either and or, are both in the same sentence. Both and and can work that way, as in, as in this next example. Both my parrot and my friend would sure like a free sample. So over here on the right of your screen, then you'll see the uh, words that work together uh, as a conjunction, both and, as in the company deals in both hardware and software, either or, I will eat either carrots or peas for dinner, neither nor, Natalie liked neither milk nor ice cream or cream cake, sorry, didn't read that. Whether or do you care whether we have noodles or rice for dinner? Not only, but he not only studies hard, but also works well, such that it's such a tiny kitchen that I don't have to do much to keep it clean. Scarcely when. Scarcely had she entered the room when the phone rang. No sooner than, no sooner did he enter the room than he saw a snake. Subordinating conjunctions. So these are conjunctions that relate to things. And these are conjunctions where one is kind of subordinated to another. Some have more to do with time, like after and before, when and while, until and since. Until and since, to name a handful more. After playtime, we'll clean up. While I slept, she'd holler. See how these refer to when? Since, like since last May, I'm taller. We're just about out of time, so I'm not gonna go over um, all these subordinating conjunctions, but they're there for you to look like to look at if you want to review this session. Um, final slide about conjunctions. Some conjunctions join what doesn't seem to go together, as in my dad loves Tampa, even though he hates the weather. Or mom's a ballroom dancing champ champ although she's quite a klutz. Yes, all these are connecting words. No ifs, no ands, no buts. So our final quiz for today. Um, okay, I think I've got this poll launched. Sorry, I goofed it up here. Um, so, true or false? The acronym FANBOYS stands for finally, after, now, by, only, yes, and since. Question number two. Sentences can begin with conjunctions, true or false. Number three. Correlative conjunctions require two conjunctions in a single phrase or sentence. Four. Subordinating conjunctions can also be more than one word, such as even though or only if. 
Number five, the fear of using words like and, if, or, but, and, or is called conjunct conjunctivitis. Uh, let's just go over. The acronym FANBOYS stands for, actually, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. So this would be false. Sentences can begin with conjunctions. True. We talked about that. If they have a good purpose. Correlative conjunctions require two words in a single phrase or sentence. Yes, that's true. Either or, more than. Subordinating conjunctions can also be more than one word. That's true. Uh, some are just one word, but uh, others are more than one word. And the fear of using words like and, if, for, but, or is called conjunctivitis. That's false. I don't think there is anything called conjunctivitis. So um, I believe we're at time. Thank you very much for um, being here today. Uh, some homework will be posted in the usual places. And I want to say thank you for hanging in. On Wednesday, we will have our final session. And um, so I'll sign off for now. Thank you.